Welcome to this talk, Governance as Enlightened Laziness. Managing hundreds, thousands of sites, um, but you want to do that while maintaining your sanity. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. I love being lazy, and so with that, here's my introduction. I'm uh, John Richards. I work at Pantheon. Um, I live, well, actually it says I live in St. Louis, Missouri. I just moved right outside, but it's the closest place nearby, so you know. Mostly true facts listed on here, um, and I'm so glad uh, to finally be able to spend some time with people. Um, I love getting to travel, and that was not possible until now, so yay, Drupal Con, it's amazing. Uh, Drupal Camp Florida here. So um, that's me, I'm John, and I'm super excited to be able to give this presentation with Raymond. Uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll be doing a joint presentation. My name is Raymond Wang. I'm a solutions engineer with Pantheon. Uh, so I, at Pantheon, I help with technical validation. I explain parts of the platform, help people get onto the platform. Uh, previous to platform, uh, previous to Pantheon, I actually spent a number of years as a Drupal and WordPress consultant. Uh, I spent about six, seven years at Acquia as a Drupal consultant. And so the bulk of my experience there kind of has shaped uh, some of our experiences, the, the pains that we kind of navigated through and kind of gave, uh, gave this talk some of its legs. I live in Phoenix. I live in Phoenix proper. Uh, I love traveling when traveling is a thing. I uh, explore cities through food and people, and so I love doing that. Looking forward to doing more of that. Uh, I'm terrible at formatting slides. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, that's, that's about it. All right. Uh, before we jump into it, uh, just a just a quick. Uh, we're gonna try to uh, work in different elements. We're kind of uh, doing this on the, a little bit on the fly with us. So, uh, a quick poll around: How many people in here are currently managing like more than ten sites? More than 10? Okay, great. Uh, so most of the people in this room under 10 sites, managing less than 10 sites, work on less than 10 sites? Great. Uh, how about, how many people in here are developers? Are married developers? Uh, and then other roles are uh, like project management? Uh, I'm a DevOps manager. DevOps manager, okay, great. Uh, and then uh, industry, are people in agencies? How many people are in agencies? How many people work with uh, education, government, nonprofit? And then how many people are just working for companies? Regular companies? Great. Okay, cool. We'll, we'll, we'll shape things a little bit accordingly. Um, as we, as, as I confuse the person outside with this, this slide, uh, I'm going to introduce you to a little bit of a, a core memory of mine. Uh, so uh, when I was six or seven years old, I was in second grade. Uh, around December, a uh, teacher comes around the classroom, puts a piece of graph paper on everybody's desk, says, okay, well, we're going to make, uh, we're going to have a holiday party, and so we're going to make snow for the holiday party. And so he gave everybody in the classroom a little pair of scissors, piece of graph paper, a piece of graph paper and all the little kids would cut out all of the little squares to cut, make confetti. Uh, if you got done with that sheet of paper, you just got up, picked up another sheet of paper and then cut out all the individual squares. This elementary teacher went to the back of the room. Don't know how long she was back there. Don't know how long we were doing this task. I just know that uh, at the end of a certain amount of time, she got up from the back of the room, came up to the front, looked around at our little piles of confetti, uh, and decided that wasn't enough snow. So she just took like a stack of paper uh, went to the back of the room again, and then proceeded to generate the, the same amount of confetti that we had generated in however long she did it within like a minute or two. Uh, this is a core memory of mine because I, had, I can't explain the anger and feeling of betrayal <laughs> coursing through my little body at that point, and that's where I swore I would look for like frameworks so that I would never have to waste my efforts again. And so that kind of uh, shapes like we said, uh, what we're going to be talking about in, um, uh, in governance and how you uh, be more efficient and be uh, enlightened in your laziness. Uh, my, my core memory is much later in life. Um, so I didn't, I mentioned, so I worked at, at Pantheon now, but before this I spent seven years um, 
Started as a web developer, ended up leading the web developer team there eventually um, at a university. So I worked at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, and when we got there, we had a very similar thing, but with websites. Um, and our problem was we were trying to make bespoke websites all the time. Um, and that seemed great. We were a central, um, we were inside the central marketing uh, group of our organization, and we were like, we're going to generate websites. And we started out with just a few websites and the idea seemed to work, but then more people wanted them and we suddenly started to get more sites coming in than uh, we could create. And it was, you know, there's a benefit to working in it inside of an organization because, you know, we didn't have the, we, we had a steady amount of work coming in, but the downside was um, we couldn't tell people no. And so all of a sudden, all of these extra websites started to come in and we started to get further and further down this hole of, a backlog of work that we needed to do. We would get a request and it would go into this queue and we would just have to wait till eventually we got there. There was no priority for anything. It was first person to ask, they get it, comes next. Some of these sites mattered, but some of these sites, I worked on one of the sites that came in. Um, me and uh, we, we had a, a three pronged approach. So we had a, a designer, myself as the developer at the time, and then we had a content strategist. The three of us worked on this site uh, for about three months to roll out this beautiful site we were so proud of. And then within a year, they abandoned that site, moved on to something new, and we looked and only about, um, I believe it was less than a thousand people had ever visited that site. Three full-time employees had worked for three months each and only a thousand people ever even looked at it and then it was just gone. And so it was a huge waste of time. And so this challenge began to become very real as we were suddenly overwhelmed um, and trying to make these one-off things. And it was like, what do we do? What are we going to do? And so that's, that was my spot in higher education. You might be here because you're starting to feel some of those growing pains. Uh, so we want to kind of call out some of those pain points. Um, it can happen no matter what industry you're in, but if you start to work on more than one site, um, suddenly you might start to feel like, oh no, all my time is spent uh, doing maintenance. So as we built these sites, then people wanted us to maintain them and we're like, sorry, you're gonna have to wait till you're back in the queue so we can come back and work on your site again. Uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the pain points that come out of this that you might be feeling. Yeah, so before we get into you know, solutions, recognizing what the problem is, you know, the common pains are felt in multiple different places. So you can see the you can feel them in organization, like in what you're actually producing. And then the most common thing, the most noticeable thing is when your end clients start feeling these pains. So we dive into the details a little bit. So uh, usually you see this as uh, sites are growing, the number of sites are growing. You can see them during replatforming efforts. So saw this a lot when people move to Drupal, like I started way back Drupal 6 uh, with uh, Arizona State University putting about 100 site per multi-site, kind of like throwing it up, to, uh, throwing these things together very, very quickly. Uh, we saw it again in Drupal 7 and 8, and then now that 7 is going in legacy end of life, we're going to see this again as people shift platforms. You'll see uh, developers will kind of get overwhelmed with a couple of common tasks. So they have to migrate their customers from the existing platform to the new platform. They have to still acquire new customers. Uh, the, the new platform generally is in MVP form, so they have to develop features for the new platform. Uh, the old platform is still standing and still running probably some of your key clients, and so you still have to do bug, bug fixes and updates for that too. And so developers and teams are starting to juggle these things during these replatforming efforts. And then you can see like the effects of this, the pains that are felt uh, across the organization. The most common one I, I found uh, when I was doing consulting uh, was that you would hear that marketing and IT just didn't get along. Like one person would be like, oh, they're always asking for crazy things. The other person is, they never deliver anything or they say no to everything. And there's this kind of adverse relationship between departments, between teams, they don't really talk to each other. Uh, you can see that uh, there's a lot of ad hoc things, uh, diff maybe li different look and feel according to you know different department or a, a professor gets exactly what they want where another one just gets like a brochure side or something along those lines. Um, a, a great one is there's no inventory of sites. It's like somebody is like, 
can you tell me all of the products you have? And you just kind of point to the server vaguely and say, <laughs> they're there, hopefully. Uh, and then, uh, of course, there's no good workflows, prioritization. So these are kind of organizational things that you might feel as you start to grow, as, as the number of demands on your team start to outweigh the resources. Uh, other things that you see are uh, pains in production. So uh, developers get stuck with menial tasks. So menial tasks can be things like uh, changing you know, the content of the website itself, or changing colors, or moving the search box from the left to the right, back to the left again. Uh, analysts get stuck in like request limbo, where they say, you know, hey, I need this done. Developer says, make a request. Request goes in the queue and then lost, and then comes back and says, hey, I need this done. Did you make a request? I did. Where is the request? Make another request to follow that up. Uh, uh, you see, uh, as John said, sometimes this new site queue or new feature queue extends past what you might think is a reasonable amount. With one of the universities that I consulted with, a new site build uh, of five, ten pages would be a six-month wait before they would be able to get to, their development team would be able to get to that. Uh, in clients, of course, you can feel they're, they're the most vocal and they have the most power because they're coming to you with uh, resources and money and those expectations. And so when they start feeling the pain, is the, that's when everybody starts noticing, everybody starts feeling the pain. So in clients will complain about wait times, uh, if you have internal clients, uh, people internal to the agency, uh, and they have to resort to external agencies to get certain work done that the internal groups are supposed to be responsible for, that's a sign that things are kind of starting to crack a little bit. Uh, and then what you see is when people uh, go outside, so this is with large companies, universities, government, all, all levels, uh, all groups of people. When they start going and contracting out, what they'll bring back might not fit into the system that you have, and so it makes your platform or system a little bit more brittle, it takes more effort to uh, update, it takes more effort to uh, uh, develop features for, and then it sucks even more time out of developer's resource pool. This is familiar, People, some people are nodding their hand. We can turn this into an informal therapy session if you <laughs> people need to get things out, but uh, the, uh, the summary of this is, you know, it, it does get better, uh, you're not alone. Uh, we've seen this, seen this along, uh, a lot of times. And so, if we're going to summarize things uh, into a too long didn't read, um, governance is going to be how an organization handles requests and decisions. So requests coming in, how do you organize that? How do you address them? How do you make sure that they're timely and prioritized? And then decision making is how do you decide what to build? How do you decide where to direct the efforts of your team? How do you decide the focus? So governance is a, a means to, to address scaling problems. Uh, we're going to talk about all the different aspects of it, but uh, given the amount of time, we're just going to kind of skim. Uh, suffice it to say that it's a, it's a complicated thing. You know, you can have very centralized governances. You can have governances which are divided into different departments that take care of different things. Uh, we can, we're going to talk a little bit about what governance covers. So uh, what is it, uh, does it cover feature development or maintenance or things like that? Uh, and most important, you know, how do we address uh, pains and processes? So first thing, what is governance? Um, much smarter person than me, uh, Lisa Welshman wrote a great book called Managing Chaos. She has a, a consulting group that kind of focuses almost exclusively on governance, particularly of large organizations. She describes it as a digital governance is a framework for es establishing accountability roles, decision-making authority for an organization's digital presence. Uh, so it's a decision-making framework. Uh, it involves people, process, and technologies. This is something that's really critical to understand from a development point of view, that the technology won't save you by itself. You know, the technology has to be supported by people, it has to be supported by processes. Uh, and so, you know, we have a lot of great talks focusing on specific technologies and how to do things, and, uh, and we'll let them talk about those things. And in here, uh, it's less technological. We're talking a little bit more about processes and people and how that gets supported. Um, and it's the organizational mechanism for addressing competing priorities. So if your developers have a lot on their plate and they can't decide what they should be working on, 
a framework should be in place to help them focus. So they don't, they don't have to be making those sorts of decisions. They can just focus on doing their work. So a couple of analogies uh, when we're talking about governance that help. Uh, having talked about governance before, uh, in the US, we have like kind of a knee-jerk reaction to the word governance uh, in, as far as what it means. Uh, we usually think of something like the DMV when we say something like governance. Or when I say governance, people immediately think brand standards. They think of what can't you do, right? What do you, are you restricting people from doing? And we want to emphasize that governance is an enabler. It's about allowing people to focus. It's allowing people to do things. Uh, the, the analogy I like is instead of thinking of, about uh, the DMV, you think about traffic norms. Like the idea that you drive on the right side of the road. Everybody knows you drive on the right side of the road. When you come to a stop sign, the person to your right, or whoever got there first gets to go first, whoever's to your right gets to go first, right? These kinds of norms make it so that you don't have to be thinking about these decisions every time you get on the road. If everybody individually decided which side of the road they're gonna drive on or what they're gonna do when they hit the stop sign, you know, everybody would be a little bit more stressed. Uh, but because we establish these norms, we can focus on other things. The other very uh, common analogy that I like is thinking about the moving between jazz trios and orchestra, right? In a jazz trio, you can have very limited governance. You can kind of key off of each other, figure out what you're going to do. You know, you might hum a few bars, you might ha say you're going to play in this key or shift in this over, over a certain amount of time, uh, and then just kind of wing it and then play off of each other as you're going. In most digital teams, this is kind of how they started. They started with a small team. You take this thing, I'm gonna take this thing, we're gonna do this, and you can kind of work keying off of each other uh, as, as you go. But at a certain point, when you get to like an orchestra size, uh, you can't do that anymore, right? And so you need a different kind of governance in order to do the kind of work that orchestra can generate. Uh, the other thing that I like about the orchestra analogy is it it really, like, maps well to dev teams because basically you appoint somebody to wave a stick around in the middle and everybody else gets to do real work. So, so this, it's, it's great. You just have an idea. You say, this is how we're going to do something. This is how we're going to organize. And then you can focus on the thing that you're trying to do. So everything, we're just trying to shift from the idea of hand-built, snowflake, art, artisanal sites or artisanal projects and move toward more of a factory model where there is a product, a thing that you do, and then there are customizations on the side. Any questions about this? Go, get so far. All right, so last thing I'm gonna to touch on, and we're gonna go back to John. Uh, the types uh, of governance that we see, uh, they are generally uh, central, federated, or distributed. Distributed is each group kind of decides things by themselves. Federated is usually one group will give certain tools that you can optionally use or not use. And kind of like, you know, they say, you know, maybe it governs a specific thing, like we will pass out brand standards, but we don't care about what you do with content. And then central is everything kind of goes through one central group. Uh, as you kind of work in your organizations, it's important to kind of note that you can have hybrid models in, in how you address things. And just because governance over one topic uh, follows one type, like maybe you centralize the branding standards, it doesn't mean everything else needs to follow that same type and model. Uh, you can vary according to the need or feature or the, uh, the thing that's kind of putting pressure on your resources. Uh, as far as things that governance will uh, uh, govern. All right, so yeah, so with, when you start thinking about governance, we're talking a lot here about just the whole landscape of your digital governance or your website governance, but you, there's a whole team that pulls that together, and we can see that from the diverse group of people here when we talk about roles being in very different roles, and that kind of governance, um, while you're still tackling these like large-scale problems across sites, um, they can be very different challenges depending on maybe the role you have. Now I've, used, I've got listed here code, design, and content, because that's what I'm most familiar with, and those tend to be pretty large buckets to catch most of the things if you're, you're generous on, on the definition of what code means. Um, and it can cover a lot of this. But I, so I just wanted to call this out. 
Now, I am a, a back-end developer, so I can't speak too much to design. I do know a lot of designers and, and content strategists, uh, so I get the value of it, but I'm like, you decide this, I'll try to support how I can. But um, as we talk about this, we're, it's coming from a little bit of a uh, back-end developer kind of perspective, um, but I did want to highlight that these are also incredibly important. Um, with, with content governance, um, it is both a like the actual content that you're talking about that you may have governance around. Uh, for instance, where, where I was at, we had you know a whole style guide on the specific um, you know ways you could spell certain things, the ways our our name needed to be used. Uh, but then there's also kind of the the process of like approval that needs to happen, and suddenly that can start to be some code gets involved there. Is you're like. I've got to develop out this workflow now that gets the right approvals and the right people in chain here uh, to be able to approve this content. Similar things with design. There's the pure uh, aesthetics piece. Um, Raymond was already talking about the importance of like brand guidelines, things like that that are going to fall under this design piece that you're going to want to make sure. Hey, well, and, and this depends on your spot. You know, if you're at a uh, a single company, you may have guidelines that fall under design. If you're working at an agency, then it may be that you're trying to figure out for your client, like what is your brand that you need to pull in here and now begin to use. So um, how how these like play into your spot is going to change as you go along. Um, but code is really where um, I'm going to kind of dig in because this is often where lots of things start to kind of headbutt and um, begin to, to crash together and have problems. So we've got a series of like questions here that you should be thinking about as you're jumping into this. So when you think about your architecture, like how are you architecting these sites? Um, thinking about what kind of code is shared. This gets uh, you know in a uh, a, a single place setting, you might have um, a setup where you're like sharing a lot of code between your sites. You might be in an agency environment and you're not able to share a lot of that, but maybe there's some core modules or things that you're like, we're going to use this on every single thing. So how can you be able to share that? What resources might need to be shared across these things? Um, and, you're, and you're thinking here, um, you know, about like what kind of what infrastructure am I going to be using here as I architect this out to make sure uh, that things stay up? Um, what things are shared where I have to worry about like failure points between these? And, and the reason you're asking these questions is, um, back to that analogy, you don't want to be answering this on every single site. Like if every time another site comes along, you have to stop and run through all these questions, it's going to take a lot of time. And being the lazy person, I mean, the efficient person that I am, I want to make sure that I've got time for all of my board games, for all the restaurants I want to go try out, all the Drupal camps I want to go to. Um, so I'm going to try and answer these questions just one time for everything. Um, and so that's the goal you're really looking to, so you can scale that out. Um, thinking about access, permissions is super important, um, and then just ownership. Because at the end of the day, this is going to go up, and people are going to say, I want something else. I want something different. And somebody's got to own that really hard spot of saying no, but in a way that uh, sounds like they're saying yes and explaining why these choices were made and maybe here's an alternative or, or here, no, this is why we're doing this. And sometimes at the end of the day, it does have to be a no um, that says we can't do this. I, I started out as a developer saying, you know, anything's possible. And anytime somebody asks for something, I would say, well, if we do enough of these loops, we actually could do that. And then maturity, I think, is starting to get to the point where you're like, sorry, that's not possible. And what that really means is like, not within the boundaries that we've set. Um, you're not being disingenuous, but it is important because at the end of the day, these serve everybody. We can't suddenly say, well, you're special. You now get to drive on the other side of the road. That's just not how it works. Uh, the other piece you're going to be thinking about, maybe you got your architecture locked, locked down, but then as you think about your deployments. And so now we're getting into the actual the, the code that you're writing. Um, where are you testing this kind of stuff? Uh, do you have a, a flow so that things aren't breaking constantly? Um, I have totally uh, pushed changes out, and then that change went across 100 websites, and all of them broke at once. And so, like, it's really bad. I felt bad when I broke one site, but when you suddenly take down 100 websites, it's just a whole different thing. And people start calling, and you're like, uh, oh, hang on, hang on, I'm trying to figure this out. And so, as you start to work at a scale, you really do have to make sure that you're adding in a lot more checks and balances, making sure that you're testing things. Um, how are you going to deploy these? 
uh, people start wanting to know um, when, when you have a lot of people um, and you're gonna make changes, letting people know ahead of time. So you start getting into like communication and change management as you talk about deployment releases and letting people know what's going on. Um, thinking about how Git's going to work at your place, how you're gonna collaborate. These are just really important things you're gonna wanna consider. And then all of that, whatever you build, is not gonna be right. I think you're just, but you need to pick something and start somewhere. And so um, it's really important to get feedback from, from team members, from the people who are receiving this, whether it's clients or, or people at your company, whoever that is, and learning like what's working here. How do we improve this? How do we begin to handle you know, these bugs? You know what's, while it's terrible, whenever I made a mistake and took down 100 websites, what was amazing was when we found we had uh, an accessibility issue with all of our uh, link colors were not the right contrast, and we were able to make a change, and the next day, 100 different websites suddenly had an accessibility issue fixed because we were able to handle those bug bugs at scale. So in a way, it can also be beneficial when you need to make a change like that. Um, and then just how are you gonna decide on new features? Whenever you're adding something new, remember you're thinking long-term maintenance, and it's gonna impact it could impact everybody. So depending on the architecture, do you have a way to just make this change on one site or do you have to make this for everyone and now have to deal with that? So uh, you wanna start thinking at a much bigger scale whenever you start to add in all these extra websites. Yeah, so what John is laying out were kind of like initial sets of questions that you, you like, you start feeling the pains and then you start examining in order to get out of the pain, in order to move into more of a solution space. Um, these are kind of like the initial sets of questions that, that you start with. And, and the, the goal out of the solution process, uh, I would say are three things. Uh, you want maps, you want menus, and you want processes. Right? So if you're thinking about trying to boil everything down, like at every level of the organization, you can go into a specific development team or you can do across a digital team or across an entire company, you can boil these aspects down into these, these three things, maps, menus, or processes. So what are maps? Uh, what maps are, are, it's an inventory. It's what you are doing. What, what is everybody working on? Like how do things work? Uh, you, you'd be surprised with very large companies, uh, sometimes they're just not ready with this question. This is like, how does your publishing process work? How does an idea go from somebody's head to appearing on the website? What kind of approval processes need to go? Uh, what kind of avenues does, does content need to go through in order to get to this final product? Uh, same with feature development. You can think of it, all of these terms and what is the life cycle of a feature starting from a request all the way to it's pushed live uh, uh, how does how does that work? So you can inventory, you can create a map of virtually anything that you want governance around the sites and contents, the agencies that you're incorporating, the content uh, itself, approval processes, etc. The second thing is having a menu. Once you've kind of established like this is what you are doing, that gives you a little bit better stance in how to abstract what you're doing. Often what we've found uh, while I'm consulting is multiple developers will be doing the same thing different ways, right? And they don't know that they are doing the same thing the different ways. Or they will ask the same question over and over again. The very common thing is somebody comes in, they want a website, uh, the response is, what do you want on your website? What do you want? Uh, instead of saying, well, what do you want, you're going to shift to, here's what we have done and here's what we have. Because when you say, here's what we've done, here's what we have, you limit the options, one, uh, you know you can deliver, you know what the delivery timeline is on what you have done before. Uh, you can reduce the number of custom engagements, you reduce the number of snowflakes that kind of come up. Uh, you can head off a lot of technical problems immediately by offering a solution rather than just being like, what in, what in the world do you want? Yes. Expectation management. It is expectation management. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, uh, do Do you want to be a consultant? I uh, <laughs> love, love that. That's uh, that's absolutely that's absolutely great. Being able to say, you know, this is what we can give in this amount of time, like it really gets away from that pain of how long is this going to take. And when you can say, well, we can do this much because it's just out of the box. Is this much? but this custom work is going to take X more amount of time, 
again, expectation management reduces friction, it reduces anger and frustration and all of those sorts of things. What that does is allows, once you have this kind of menu, this kind of product list that you're able to develop, in some universities it's like a set of kinds of sites, right? It's every site that you develop isn't a completely new, unique situation, right? In a university setting or a company setting, the sites that you develop but do specific things, like they are professors' lab sites, or they are events sites, or they are brochure sites, right? Those, those functions have certain capabilities associated with them. Once you start categorizing and being able to shovel people into those various areas, then your developers can work on harder problems, like, okay, well, we need to figure out what SSO is going to work like. We're going to try to figure out a hard content sync problem across all of our sites or things like that. They can shift focus from you know setting up a site and you know like installing modules, uh, all of those sorts of things, and shift toward the harder problems that they probably wanted to work on in the first place. Part of building a menu is kind of developing, you know, like yeah, you know, this is kind of abstraction, right? Uh, you want to provide, be able to provide a menu. You want to be able to show someone. Here are some example sites. Here are some page elements that you can pick from. Here are some variations. Uh, and then as you get more and more refined in it, you can develop things like questionnaires and preparation decks so you can show them this is what your site will look like. Again, this is kind of expectation management. It's shifting them from you know complete blue sky into here's a variety of things that you can pick from, and you can be very happy picking from this nice variety of things for you. Uh, it works in, you know, if you've ever uh, uh, been part of like a home building process, buying a new home and picking certain things, people are very happy picking from specific options and knowing what, it's go what the outcomes are going to be in some cases. And then as we said, like when you, the, the most important thing is understanding not everything is going to fall into your process. The biggest critical thing that I, I find uh, in, in my consulting experience is people will develop this plan, but they don't develop a plan for things that are outside of the plan. It's critical. You need to know what happens when something falls outside of your plan. Uh, so business and technical resources, what they want to do is they want to ag aggregate and then evaluate requests across all of your clients and be able to make decisions. The most critical decision is, is this feature a snowflake or does it become part of our platform? And how do we make that decision, right? That should be a business and technical decision to say, hey, this is something that we're going to experiment now on this customer and maybe eventually we'll work into the rest of the platform and here's how it's going to work or this is going to be something that's important, so we're going to wait, spend a lot of time developing it, and just directly incorporate it into the platform, or this is uh, a completely experimental thing, it's just going to be a one-off, and it's going to be a one-off forever, but always be careful when you say, this is going to be a snowflake forever. <laughs> no one flake ever thinks that it's responsible for the avalanche. <laughs> okay. And, and uh, we've been reiterating over time. Sorry, do, is there a question in the back? Okay. As we, we, we've been reiterating kind of subtly over time is you're shifting from like this idea of I build sites to I'm building a product, right? I'm shifting from the idea of this, these are a bunch of little sites and we have a platform that creates these sites for you. And then like we said before, shifting from uh, what do you want, what do you like to does this work for you? Okay, how might we modify it or how might we customize this so it fits your purpose as well? Great. Any questions? Good. All right. So, then, so, so you've got this plan for success, and it's easy to begin to like overthink that. But what I want to encourage you to do the me, you know, just do it. Like, you've got to just do it at the end of the day. It's really easy to get tied up in on perfecting that perfect plan. Um, but you just want to start. I remember when we were getting ready to start this, like idea of like how can we begin to use governance to make our life better? How can we find some solutions that will work for a lot of people? Uh, we had a goal of if our success criteria was if we could find 12 different groups at the university who would come on board with this plan and adopt it. Um, and then a few years later we like looked back and we now had over a thousand sites 
who had adopted this plan. And so it was successful beyond anything we had, had planned for. Um, there were lots of, of crazy things along the way. There were wild migrations, which I'm sure many of you have, have dealt with, of, of that in-between state. Like, how do we deal with this now? We thought we were, were set, and then now we've got to do this migration. Um, we did some things wrong, but the thing was, we kept that iterating. We kept doing that, that process. Um, I also love how Raymond like he talks about having having that menu, but also a plan for what what do you do when something doesn't fall inside your plan. We were able to start getting like 90% of our sites into this process, um, but we still had those like one-offs. But the thing was, a lot of those one-offs were the really interesting challenges. And I remember like the first time there wasn't like a next site in the queue. This process had had done, like, we began to adopt this, and it wasn't immediate, it took a few years for the, this to release a lot of that pressure, but we suddenly had a moment where we were like, wait, there's not another site to work on, we're able to actually spend, you know, take a few weeks, and we're actually going to dedicate that to improving our governance process even more, let's, let's figure out how we can be more efficient and get things like that, and so, um, you know, back to my laziness, I want to be able to have that free time so I can be even more, future John can he be even lazier down the road. Uh, and so by beginning to do this, like once you start to have that success, hopefully what you're going to see is that you do feel a lot less pressure. You're able to go to sleep at night because you don't have to worry about everything crashing because you've just like pushed it up and kind of fingers crossed that it worked. You actually had a plan. Um, you were able to test that and you know everything works now. Uh, so that's like the end goal you're looking for. And it's possible to get there. It doesn't mean you won't have some crazy nights once in a while, but you can definitely drop that number down, you know, to two a year instead of like 15. So that's your end goal as you get through this. Okay. Yeah, and, and that's a great point, bringing us back to the beginning where, you know, like, uh, we talk a little bit about laziness, like, in, in, uh, obviously laziness is about efficiency so that you can churn out specific things much more quickly, much more effectively, uh, satis you know, address expectations, you know, really satisfy people's, uh, satisfies people's needs more quickly without, you know, losing your sanity or while maintaining your sanity, uh, et cetera. Uh, so that's just one part of it, right? Like it's not just you know being efficient uh, and, and then churning out more work. Like the the real special bit of it is with these processes in place, you know you can be more efficient, you can do all of those things, but then you can really focus yourself on the things that matter, the things that are actually unique snowflakes in your organizations, in your feature builds, in the things that you want to work on. So you get to focus on the things that you want to do instead of uh, the menial tasks. And that's about all we had. Uh, we wanted to save a little bit of time for questions, if people had questions. Uh, also, understanding this is a, a real stress-laden topic, so if anybody needs to, you know, a hug or to cry it out or in you know, a talk circle, we have we want to reserve a little bit of space for that. I should toss that.